Uh, tonight's uh, heroically brave speaker, uh, Cam Gray, Associate Professor of Classical Studies in Penn's Department of Classical Studies, describes himself as a social historian, working particularly in the late and post-Roman world, the third through seventh century CE. Amongst other things, he studies rural communities in late antiquity, how they worked, what strategies, institutions, and structures they possessed, for maintaining equilibrium and managing conflict, and what they did when things went wrong. Of course, great catastrophes. This whole year we've been looking at what goes wrong, right? This leads in turn to consideration of the social dynamics of disasters in the period. What factors made particular com communities vulnerable or resilient in the face of potentially catastrophic natural hazards, military incursions, famine, or disease? and how those communities might have experienced, responded to, and recovered from such events. Much of his recent work reflects these interests, such as a volume in progress entitled Living with Risk in the Late Roman World, a recent article on climate change and agrarian change between the fourth and the sixth centuries, questions of scale, coincidence, and causality, and his involvement in the archeological field work of the Roman Peasant Project in Tuscany, Italy which seeks to uncover the lived experience of the peasantry in the Roman period, their diet, economic activities, and social networks. And to say just one more thing about Cam, it's always a personal pleasure to be able to introduce one of our Penn faculty members who's a real friend of the museum. Uh, Cam often teaches in the museum using the resources of our collection study room, and we appreciate that you do that, Cam, and it's great to have you here doing our first uh, digital great lecture. Oh, indeed. So now then, it's time to hand over to Cam to talk to us about an earthquake that shook the world, seismicity and society in the late fourth century. Cam. Thank you, Steve. Um, can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Excellent. All right. So uh, here I am. Um, that you've said everything that I was going to say about myself. So um, I really don't need to introduce myself in any way, it seems, beyond saying that I think I remember um, actually being a participant in the uh, early days of the Daily Digs, um, actually sending a, a video from Tuscany. I'm not sure if anybody was uh, in the audience for that particular day where some of my students held artifacts up to the uh, the tiny screen like this. Um, I'm hoping to keep my hands away from my screen, uh, from my camera. Um, I'm going to share my screen now um, and begin this presentation. Let's see if we can get my slideshow up, uh, and then I will begin. <clears throat> so let me introduce you to uh, the Emperor Julian, uh, who is uh, on this wonderful coin, which is a part of the, the Penn Museum's collection. Um, as we'll see over the course of the lecture, Julian is heavily implicated in this earthquake, in the, the opinion of some of our authors at least. Uh, an emperor who um, rejected Christianity at a time when most of our Christian authors thought that that was a mistake. Uh, and he's going to sort of weave in and out of uh, our discussion today of whether in fact this was uh, a single disaster or many disasters. So without any further ado, earthquakes can be scary things. They occur largely without warning and may be followed by a series of equally unheralded and unexpected aftershocks that can last days, weeks, months, or even years. The sudden shifting, trembling, or shaking of the ground, the collapse or warping of familiar structures, and the ensuing physical, mental, and emotional instability that these can cause, combine to render the earthquake a mysterious, terrifying phenomenon with a temporal horizon that far exceeds the seconds or minutes of the actual event. While we may wish to impose a scientific objectivity upon our experience, insisting that earthquakes are natural phenomena occurring at the places where the Earth's tectonic plates rub against, slide over, or pull away from one another, and therefore serving to release the built-up energy that results uh, from such an experience, we can't get away from the fact that right now um, I'm having a slight challenge getting my slides going. Okay, it's difficult to resist the urge to appeal to the metaphysical in seeking to understand or explain these events. 
Given the uneven distribution of tectonic plates across the Earth's surface, it seems reasonable to suggest that particular places are especially earthquake prone. Moreover, there is some evidence to suggest that seismic activity can cluster together in time as well as space. And here's a, a slide giving a, a small number of, of earthquakes that are, uh, that are sort of collocated uh, in a very particular short period of time. If our written sources are to be believed, the period between the middle of the fourth century and the second half of the sixth century CE was one of just such intense seismic activity in the Mediterranean region. Christian and pagan sources alike attest to a collection of earthquakes and tsunamis, volcanic eruptions and unexplained dust veils. Connected, attendant or coincidental famines, pestilences and plagues feature prominently also in our surviving literature. The authors of that literature are quick to point out the cosmic significance of these events as omens, divine expressions of favour or disfavour, or commentaries upon the events of the secular world. Modern scholars have jumped upon this seeming ubiquity of destructive earthquakes, tsunamis and volcanic eruptions, dubbing this period the early Byzantine tectonic paroxysm, the EB, TP. Drawing on both written sources and physical evidence, much scholarly effort has been devoted to identifying particular events, establishing their dates and offering a rough measure of their magnitudes. There's been a certain amount of attention paid also to the ways in which individual events were employed in the culture wars of the period, as warnings to a wavering flock, confirmations of long-held philosophical convictions, or literary metaphors for the earthly struggle waged by pagans and Christians for the hearts and minds of the populace. However, analysis of the role played by these events in shaping or influencing historical and societal processes of the period, or of their impact upon the day-to-day -day lives of the denizens of this world, has tended to be rather less sophisticated. Characteristically, individual events are identified as convenient markers or punctuations of the inevitable devolution and dissolution of late antique society. Strings of events are then linked together in a sequence which implicitly implicates natural disasters in the so-called decline and fall of the Roman Empire. The purpose of this paper is to begin upon the task of rescuing natural disturbances such as earthquakes, together with the human disasters that they sometimes catalyse, from these rather unreflective and tautological analytical frameworks. In what follows, I shift the focus of attention away from the moment of the earthquake and concentrate instead upon recapturing this society's culture of risk. That is the pervading ever-present sense of contingency that characterized the everyday lived experiences of the inhabitants of this world. To this end, I explore the circumstances surrounding one earthquake, which a long established scholarly convention locates on a subduction fault line southwest of Crete and dates to 365 CE. So we'll start with some textual uh, accounts. In his account of the life and deeds of the holy man Hilarion, written at Bethlehem in around 390 CE, the late Roman theologian, confessor, priest, and writer Jerome offers a striking vignette of his hero's successful deliverance of the community of Epidaurus, that's modern day Kavtat, southeast of Dubrovnik on the Adriatic coast of Croatia from a tsunami. Now I should also say that there are gonna be just a small number of, of names that perhaps folks won't have heard before. Um, and some texts. Don't worry about the names and don't worry about the texts either. They're more sort of aids, uh, aids for memory, if you like. <clears throat> Jerome explicitly connects this, uh, the earthquake which generated this tsunami to the death of the Emperor Julian, whose short but eventful reign had been characterised above all by a conscious rejection of Christianity as the religion of empire and a concerted effort to replace it with a systematic and institutionalized form of Neoplatonic Hellenism. Jerome evokes both the flood narrative from the Old Testament book of Genesis and the image uh, of Moses parting the waters of the Red Sea contained in Exodus before declaring that the event um, is 
still some 25 years later preserved in the collective memory of the residents of the region. This account complements and elaborates upon a rather shorter notice that Jerome included in his continuation of the chronicle undertaken by the early fourth century Christian historian and chronographer Eusebius of Caesarea. In that entry, which concerns the early years of the reign of Valentinian and Valens and was composed in the early 380s, Jerome laconically records that an earthquake having occurred throughout the whole world the shore is invaded by the sea and falling debris in innumerable cities of Sicily and of many islands crushed the people. Again, we gain the impression of an all encompassing event comprising an earthquake accompanied by a tsunami. Although this time the geographical focus is Sicily and other unnamed islands, which we're told suffered both considerable damage and significant loss of life. Meanwhile, writing at Rome during the 380s, the Syrian-born historian Ammianus Marcellinus offers a narrative of events which implicates the Egyptian city of Alexandria and Methone on the Peloponnesian Peninsula of Greece. Ammianus adds dramatic touches of thunder and lightning preceding the actual earthquake, paints a detailed cinematic vista of the suddenly revealed seashore off the coast of Alexandria, and offers a historian's claim to autopsy when he remarks upon a stranded ship that he saw with his own eyes while sojourning in southern Greece. These three short notices each reference an earthquake and attendant tsunami which they date to the mid 360s CE. Each is written within a generation of the events it describes and each invites its reader to conclude that it derives from some combination of received knowledge direct familiarity and personal experience. In each case also, there's an immediate textual and generic context that must be taken into account. Jerome's life of Hilarion, for example, is haunted by the spectre of the Emperor Julian, who's portrayed explicitly singling out the saint for punishment and hounding him across the Mediterranean. For this and other reasons, the text is richly laden with novelistic themes of travel, misidentification, bandits and pirates. In Jerome's treatment, the saint is restlessly and perpetually in motion and possesses, moreover, palpable power over both physical and metaphysical threats. A consequence, we may interpret the text as an emblematic example of hagiographical literature, that is, an exemplary portrait of the life, deeds, miracles and holiness of a Christian saint. In the present context, it seems clear also that throughout Jerome's text, Hilarion is credited with a special quality of control over water, a control which fundamentally underpins the dramatic events at Epidaurus. Ammianus, for his part, presents a dazzling tour de force which displays all of his considerable skills as an author. Here, as elsewhere in his text, he engages closely and deeply with a multitude of previous writers, subtly and carefully reworking the material they provide within the context of his own project. But while his trip to Methone seems relatively uncontroversial, it's not clear that he ever visited Alexandria, and in any event, there's a palpable imprecision in his description, which raises the possibility that he's not talking about the Egyptian coast at all. An impressive variety of 5th and 6th century histories and chronicles echo, complement or enhance the information contained in these three short notices. In general, this increasingly muddled tradition is characterised by a tendency towards further conflation of the earthquake, the tsunami and the ill-starred reign of the Emperor Julian. Clearly, by simultaneously rejecting the substance and embracing the form of Christianity, Julian crystallised both the contingency and the urgency of the struggle between pagan and Christian thinkers in the period. That metaphysical struggle found physical expression in seismic activity, whether that be a series of earthquakes dispersed across the Mediterranean world, as hinted at by uh, writers such as Libanius and Ammianus himself, or as in Jerome's account, a single massive universal event. The exact epicentre of that event is nowhere mentioned in our fourth, fifth or sixth century sources. For that, 
we must turn to the 9th century Byzantine monk George Hamartolos, who for the first time explicitly locates this earthquake off the island of Crete. In response to the rhetorically coloured and rather confused textual tradition, modern scholars have turned to archaeological, geological and hydrological evidence to aid in their reconstructions of seismicity in the period. Archaeological indicators of earthquake damage have been unearthed at Kissimmee and elsewhere on the island of Crete. Patterns of sediment deposition and displacement that are consistent with the actions of a tsunami have been identified off the Ionian coast, in Sicily, North Africa and the Adriatic. Geomorphologically, the coastline of Western Crete reveals an uplift of between 9 and 10 metres. This is this photograph in the, uh, the bottom corner of the slide here, and preserves traces of marine and littoral organisms, implying that the event which caused this movement was sudden and violent. Meanwhile, the eastern coastline betrays evidence of subsidence. These processes of uplift and subsidence are visible physical manifestations of activity at the tectonic plate boundary labelled the Hellenic Arc a zone characterised by the subduction, that's the, the swooshing underneath, if you like, it's going underneath, uh, the subduction of the African plate underneath the Aegean Sea plate that runs from the Ionian Islands in the west to the eastern tip of Rhodes in the east. But identifying and assigning a specific date to any of these scattered indications of seismic and tsunami activity is frustratingly imprecise. Indeed, upon closer examination, the search for the so-called Crete mega earthquake of 365 is characterised above all by a series of analytical slates of hand and slippages that should give us pause. Archaeological contexts with traces of earthquake damage at Kissimmee contain coins datable to the reign of the Emperor Constantius, who died in late 361 CE, Repair of a bath complex at Gorton is attributed to the Emperor Theodosius, but it's not clear which Theodosius, leaving us with either a late 4th century or a mid 5th century window. Dates obtained using carbon-14 techniques upon mollusks and other shellfish preserved on the uplifted portions of coastal western Crete tend to fall rather unhelpfully into a 500-year period between 1200 and 1700 years before present. Locating paleo tsunami deposits precisely in time and identifying their generative events is a rather circular exercise at the best of times. And while evidence exists for tsunami damage to the city of Alexandria in 1303, the 365 event is so far completely unattested physically. So far also, computer based fault modelling and tsunami hazard scenarios have completely failed to generate an earthquake located off the coast of Crete that's capable of producing tsunamis simultaneously in Alexandria and the Adriatic. And in any event, maps suggest that any such earthquake would necessarily have measured between 8.3 and 8.5 on the Richter scale, making it by some distance the largest earthquake attested in the Mediterranean world. Finally, Arguably the most seismically sensitive author of the period, the 6th century Antiochene chronographer John Marillas, singularly fails in his work to note any such event occurring in the 360s. This is not to say that there was no earthquake in the Mediterranean in the early years of the reign of Valentinian and Valens, nor is it to argue that such an earthquake did not generate a tsunami cause damage to buildings and loss of life, still less to deny the incidence, impact and importance of seismicity throughout this world in this period. On the contrary, I would argue that seismic activity in the Mediterranean world in late antiquity is dramatically underrepresented in the surviving evidence. It's therefore probable that there were several earthquakes in 365, each of which had the potential to inflict damage of the kind that our textual, archaeological, geological and hydrological evidence hints at. And this slide here uh, at the bottom uh, is, a, is an indication of, of uh, earthquake events between 1973 and 2009 of a magnitude greater than four. 
and there are hundreds if not thousands of them. As a consequence, to concentrate upon the reconstruction of a single hypothetically massive and destructive Mediterranean-wide earthquake, or indeed two, or three, or ten somewhat smaller such events, which have found their way into the textual evidence or can be inferred from other material, is to fundamentally misunderstand the experience that the denizens of this world had of earthquakes. Moreover, to rest those reconstructions primarily upon the rhetorical, subjective and selective written sources of the period seems a council of desperation at best and an exercise uh, in willful manipulation of the data at worst. Therefore, I propose a different approach, eschewing in the first instance the urge to identify, date and categorise individual earthquakes, and focusing instead upon everyday experiences of seismicity, practices of interpretation, incorporation, amelioration, accommodation and response, and the implications of those practices is for our understanding of how earthquakes function in the lived and imagined world of late antiquity. I'll argue that while their occurrence could indeed occasion fear, distress and dread, earthquakes were not surprising or unanticipated events that required explanation and engendered fundamental psychological dislocation among the inhabitants of this world. On the contrary, they were expected and normalised elements of everyday life and could therefore be employed as tools for explaining and understanding phenomena that were themselves novel and unexpected. In support of this argument, I make two fundamental propositions. First, earthquakes were ubiquitous in the Mediterranean world, although as a result of tectonic and geomorphological processes, they were unevenly distributed. Consequently, we may expect certain populations in certain regions to have been more or less acclimated to seismic activity and to have incorporated that activity within their socio-economic and cultural practices. Second, where they are present, earthquakes constituted one element in a given community's risk scape, the collection of hazards and opportunities that constituted their everyday lived experience, their perceptions and constructions of those hazards and opportunities, and the actions they took as a consequence, which might meet, mitigate or exacerbate the risks that confronted them. By way of conclusion, I return to the events of Jerome and Ammianus and explore the insights we might derive from analysing those accounts within the context of the author's individual risks and those of the actors in their narratives. Earthquakes constitute the most significant geohazard in the Mediterranean world. The seismicity of the region is most strongly influenced by the relationship between the African and Eurasian plates, <clears throat> which constitute a subduction, a subduction zone or convergent boundary where one plate is being smooshed underneath another. The deepest, most destructive earthquakes tend to occur at zones of this sort, although such earthquakes tend also to be relatively infrequent. To a somewhat lesser extent, the movement of the Eurasian plate relative to the Anatolian plate <clears throat> in the vicinity of the Taurus Mountains in northern Asia Minor exerts a comparable influence upon the seismicity of the eastern reaches of the Mediterranean world. Areas such as this, where two plates rub alongside one another, a term transform faults or conservative boundaries. They're the kinds of, of zones that we have in California, for example. Earthquakes at these boundaries tend to occur more frequently than those in subduction zones, but they're also shallower and involve smaller quantities of energy. Meanwhile, at the western edges of the Mediterranean, the deep earth processes that characterise the zone of deformation underlying the Iberian Peninsula remain poorly understood but it suffices to observe that it's characterised by frequent seismic activity of relatively low intensity, punctuated by events of moderate or even high intensity. For our present purposes, two observations are pertinent. First, while broadly speaking, we may regard the whole of the Mediterranean as a plate boundary, nonetheless, seismic activity concentrates in certain areas or zones. Consequence, personal experience, Knowledge and understanding of earthquakes is likely to have varied quite widely across the Mediterranean world in antiquity, as it does today. 
Second, seismicity is a phenomenon which occurs along a spectrum encompassing vibrations that are only detectable using modern instruments, through instances of earth tremors that are disquieting or surprising but largely non-destructive, to massive and lethal events involving widespread damage to property and loss of life. Moreover, there's only an imperfect correlation between the objectively measurable force of an earthquake on the one hand, and this is sort of what I'm, uh, what we often uh, regard the Richter scale as measuring, right? The objectively measurable force of an earthquake and the damage caused by that earthquake on the other. And this modified Mercalli intensity, intensity scale, which is a, a measure of experience of earthquakes um, to a certain extent, is trying to sort of evoke sense of that. The damage will be conditioned by the location of the earthquake's epicenter relative to any uh, potentially affected populations by geological structures and soil conditions, by the nature, density, and building practices of nearby settlements, even by the time of day that the earthquake occurred. In combination with the subjective nature of much of our ancient textual evidence, and the role that earthquakes play in many of those texts as mechanisms for outlining or unpacking other propositions, arguments, or claims, these aspects of seismic activity complicate the task of understanding the experience of earthquakes in antiquity. In pursuit of that experience, I'll suggest that the evidence that survives for earthquake activity, and to a lesser extent, given their comparative rareness, tsunamis, is a product of the interaction between three rather different factors. First, the location and activity of tectonic boundaries and fault zones in the region. Second, the distribution of settlement, primarily in the form of cities across the Mediterranean world. And third, the physical origin everyday experiences and interests of the authors who logged these events in their writings, together with the generic conventions within which they were writing. As a consequence, the physical and the textual evidence for earthquakes in the late Roman period both converge and diverge in analytically suggestive ways. A survey of Textual attestations of seismic activity contained in the various earthquake catalogues that have been compiled for the period invites us to identify four broad zones across the Mediterranean world. And I should mention again that this, this slide with, uh, with earthquakes um, marked on it is a massive oversimplification of the, the number of earthquakes that I think uh, probably were attested in this period. Towards the east, a cluster of attestations may be located in a, no, in a zone that concentrates uh, upon Antioch, and runs south to include also the cities of Roman Judea. These attestations are found primarily in the writings of Libanius, John Malalas, and Agathius, all of whom were residents of Antioch, as well as certain church historians who might be expected to take a special note of seismicity in the Holy Land. The second cluster covers the Greek mainland and northwestern Asia Minor, includes the cities of Constantinople, Nicomedia, and Nicaea, as well as the islands of the Aegean Sea, most notably Crete and Cyprus. So it goes a little bit further south than this oval that I've actually sketched onto this particular slide. Now, again, church historians such as Sozomen and Socrates figure prominently among the authors whose works record seismic activity in the cities of Northern Asia Minor, while the political centrality of the city of Constantinople contributes in part to its prominence in the writings of authors such as Eusebius of Caesarea, Marcellinus Comes, and John Malalas. A third concentration runs from Ravenna and Illyria in the north through Rome and other parts of the central Italian peninsula to encompass also the cities of central northern Africa, such as Cyrene, Sisyphus. Occasionally, these central Mediterranean events are recorded in the writings of our eastern sources. Seismic activity is also strongly attested in the chronographical and hagiographical works of Jerome, and noteworthy also in letters written by the residents of cities in Italy. Africa, such as Symmachus, Augustine, and Synesius. Finally, there are isolated chronicles. These zones of attested earthquake are largely coterminous with known zones of seismic activity, with the important proviso that they're also determined by the distribution of the textual evidence, which demonstrates an overwhelming preponderance of documents produced by the inhabitants of cities in the eastern portions of the empire. Contrast, there's a noteworthy dearth of written evidence for seismic activity in the westernmost provinces of the empire. 
Indeed, only one earthquake is textually attested in Galicia, Hispania, that's on the Iberian Peninsula, for the entirety of the period between the 4th and 6th centuries. When we turn to evidence for tsunamis in the Mediterranean in the period, it's worth noting that most, though not all, of these unusually long and high marine waves are generated by earthquakes. But both our written texts and the geological, hydrological and archaeological record are more sparsely populated with events of this sort than they are by evidence for seismic activity. Modern studies of tsunamis in the Mediterranean have identified a number of zones with the potential to produce tsunamis, most of which are located at tectonic plate boundaries. Meanwhile, increasingly sophisticated studies of processes of sediment transport and detailed exploration of the stratigraphy of coastal lakes, lagoons and flat fluvial plains has begun to reveal evidence for paleo tsunamis across the Mediterranean world. But the number of assist attested tsunamis for the period is vanishingly small. And in any event, the overwhelming bulk of scholarly attention has focused upon reconstructing the dynamics and effects of the event that is imagined to have occurred in 365, and using those reconstructions as tools for evaluating the vulnerability of modern cities located on the coast of the Mediterranean to comparable tsunamis. The disproportional attention paid to the event or events that dominate the accounts of Jerome and Ammiana should not surprise us. After all, their descriptions are by some distance the most detailed textual evidence that we possess for tsunami activity in the Mediterranean in this period. While both authors are explicit in attributing the genesis of the tsunami they describe to an earthquake located somewhere in the Mediterranean Sea, the gloss provided by the later church historian Sozomon, and this is Sozomon's text here on, on the slide, demonstrates a somewhat more garbled account, identifying the tsunami as the birthday of an earthquake, offering a rather fuzzy narrative of its effects and demonstrating a fairly fast and loose attitude towards its dating. We may perhaps conclude on the basis of this that tsunamis were indeed rather rare occurrences in the Mediterranean, although editorialising for a moment, it's probably also the case that Sozomon is not a terribly careful um, historian himself. Again, however, we should be wary of limiting our analysis only to massive catastrophic inundation. The detailed surveys of modern tsunami activity in the region acknowledge the somewhat more regular incidence of rather smaller events. Seismically triggered landslides causing tsunamis on the Corinthian coast. Localised tsunamis off the coast of Cyprus, the Levant, the Sea of Marmara and the Bosphorus. Tsunamis affecting the Aeolian or Lipari Islands off the northern coast of Sicily caused by the eruptic activity of the volcanic island of Stromboli, and so on. For our present purposes too, it's worth exploring briefly the evidence for tsunami activity on both the eastern and the western coasts of the Adriatic Sea. And this is the image right here in the middle of this particular slide. Detailed studies of early modern and modern accounts of such events reveal that the region around Dubrovnik boasts the highest number of reported tsunamis in the period between the century and the present day. The severity of these events varies appreciably, as too does the confidence with which they can be reconstructed. In some circumstances, earthquakes located on the landmass of Croatia appear to have precipitated sea quakes off the coast. In others, there's a specific time frame given during which the water withdrew from the shore or was observed to be measurably lower than its usual level before rushing back some days later. While we should be wary of over-interpreting this rather more modern and detailed evidence, it's possible that tsunamis in this physically constrained portion of the Mediterranean world were somewhat more recognisable and perhaps regular occurrences than they were elsewhere. Of course, it's not only the risk posed by seismicity that's accorded differential attention in our written sources. Indeed, as we might expect, authors of the period display enormous variety in their construction and perception of the world they lived in, the threats and opportunities that it posed. <clears throat> Certainly, it's not a stretch to propose that this was a risk-filled world. Dangers at once physical and metaphysical hovered constantly and insistently at the edges of human perception, 
the potential for a river to flood, an earthquake to shatter the fabric of an urban community or a volcanic eruption to transform the countryside around it loomed large in the cultural imaginary. The landscapes of this world were imminent with metaphysical power, populated by threats to life and limb in the form of bandits, soldiers, even disgruntled neighbours. Equally, year-to-year -year variation in the timing and extent of rainfall and sunlight constituted variable, if characteristically manageable, growing conditions, producing comparable variability in both supply of and demand for agricultural surpluses. In the aggregate, this variability engendered an exchange economy characterised by volatility. Sudden spikes and troughs in the availability of goods, immense variability in the flow and quality of information about the location and value of those goods. In such circumstances, considerable opportunities existed for some individuals to profit from much the same factors that created dearth for others. We occasionally catch glimpses of these circumstances, for example, in anecdotes about community members hoarding grain in order to sell it at a profit during times of shortage or in the widely held reputation of traders and merchants as grasping parasites. Similarly, societal and political uncertainty, the threat of religiously motivated violence, banditry, piracy, and other threats to health, life, or livelihood, provided opportunities for figures who were able to claim or mobilize the capacity to thwart, manage, or redirect such threats. Effectively living with risk in this world necessitated both elaborate mechanisms for management and response and nimbleness in activating those mechanisms, mitigate potential harm or to exploit opportunity for gain. <clears throat> At first blush, the diffuse and patchy nature of our evidence makes it difficult to move beyond these rather coarsely grained, general, impressionistic observations about the experience of risk in the late Roman world. But it's essential to recognise that risk is not an objective phenomenon, nor is it universally manifest, generalised or generalisable in its instantiation. On the contrary, risks are simultaneously real and constructed by social perception. The things that we fear become fearful things, while those who go looking for opportunity attend find it. Risks are, in addition, highly localised conditioned by the particular characteristics of a specific place, as well as such factors as socioeconomic status, political power, religious beliefs, age or gender. Further, no single hazard or opportunity is completely isolated. Rather, people live with multiple risks and encounter and deal with them simultaneously, not as a neatly separate uh, collection of factors. In recognition of these elements of experience, perception, construct, construction and action in the face of risk, some scholars have advanced the inelegantly named but nonetheless heuristically suggestive concept of the risk scape. To date, the principle of the risk scape has been employed only in contexts where the risks are implicitly understood or assumed to be hazardous or threatening. But risk is a rather more capacious category than that. Recent scholarship on the subject defines risk as a situation or an event where something of human value, including humans themselves, is at stake and where the outcome is uncertain. Employing this definition of risk transforms our analysis of risk scapes, allowing us to contemplate both the potential for overlaps and mutual reinforcement of diverse hazards, such as floods, droughts or earthquakes, political insecurity, social unrest or disease and the possibility that different risks will mitigate or moderate one another, as in the opportunity that exists for certain elements in a population to achieve social, economic or political mobility by responding quickly and effectively to particular environmental conditions or stepping into a power vacuum at moments of societal upheaval, religious conflict, political instability or physical destruction. The likelihood that different individuals will respond differently to the circumstances in which they find themselves signals the fact that a variety of risk scapes can coexist in the same physical location. It also reminds us that individuals and communities possess agency, both in constructing and in managing their risk scape. They do not simply respond blindly or passively to the world around them, 
although their capacity to respond is shaped in part by the amount of power and agency they possess or perceive themselves. Factors deemed to be beyond one's control or capacity to influence are treated differently to those which one perceives to be controllable. Certain objectively hazardous phenomena may therefore be consciously absenced from a risk scape. Consideration of them deemed irrelevant, unnecessary or merely psychologically harmful. In contemporary contexts, scholars have explored the ways in which nuclear power stations, toxic waste dumps or active volcanoes have been absent in these ways. In their place, communities focus upon aspects of their lived experience that they deem potentially controllable or at least tangible. Crime rates, unemployment, road safety. Perceptions of empowerment or disempowerment intersect also with notions of immediacy and temporality with the result that past experience tends to shape future anticipation. As a result, risk scapes are specifically and particularly located in time. An individual or community that has experienced an earthquake or tsunami or indeed some other trauma such as physical violence, flooding or religious persecution is likely to be more conscious of that threat into the future and to adjust or adapt behaviours as a result. This is sort of that phenomenon of um, relitigating the past, of, of planning for the, the, the previous disaster, if you like. In this way, the aggregate of everyday risks, repeatedly experienced or constantly present, tends to weigh more heavily in both collective consciousness and decision making than more abstract, distant or ephemeral threats, regardless of the objectively measurable magnitude of such threats. Conceptualising risk in this way presents certain analytical advantages over prevailing approaches to the relationship between humans and the world around them in the late Roman period. In recent scholarship, that relationship has largely been interpreted as antagonistic or oppositional, constrained by a combination of infrastructural inefficiency and societal ignorance, and engendering a cultural climate of fear that expressed itself in an increasingly prevalent conviction that the end of the world was at hand. Denizens of this world are moreover characterised as powerless victims, passive observers or unwitting enablers of the awesome climatic, environmental and biological forces that assailed and eventually, inevitably, overwhelmed them. By contrast, the notion of the risk scape navigates the relationship between nature and society not by privileging one over the other, but by making people and their environments co-actors in the transaction of everyday life. It recognises moreover that those natural societal units, firmly located in both time and space, put simply the where and the when matter. As we've seen in certain circumstances, risk has a clearly defined and mappable physical and spatial dimension. Floodplains, the hinterlands of volcanoes, tectonic zones, vulnerable coastlines and so on. Moreover, we may imagine that in some places, human actions did indeed exacerbate existing hazards. Destabilising fragile slopes through the moderate terracing, as has been argued for the Antioch Valley, for example. For better or for worse, therefore, embracing the concept of the risk scape entails acknowledging the agency of humans in constructing their world, both perceptually and through their actions. I would indeed argue that the world of late antiquity was a world infused by a pervading sense of fear. But that fear was not engendered by a sense of dread at the unknowableness of the world, nor was it an unreasoning, irrational response to the uncertainty that confronted them on a daily basis. On the contrary, knowing that the world was characterised by hazards, conditioned the populations of this world to create, enact sophisticated explanatory rubrics and apotropaic practices. The analytical concept of the risk scape provides a framework for exploring the multidimensional relationships between places, people's perceptions of those places and the actions they take in them. By way of conclusion, therefore, I apply this framework to our two most detailed accounts of the effects of tsunamis in the Mediterranean world in this period. The rhetorically constructed description of Ammianus Marcellinus is difficult to locate precisely in space. Ammianus himself hailed from Syria, though there is reason to believe that he draws on an account of a tsunami which should be located off the island of Sicily, which he, which he applies to the city of Alexandria on the Egyptian coast, 
while also mentioning a boat that's been thrown inland at Methone on the western coast of the Peloponnese. The narrative itself is detailed and plausible, which suggests that whatever is source, it was either the product of a direct eyewitness who was unusually analytical and observant, or was her or himself drawing upon an oral or textual tradition about how these phenomena work. When placed alongside textual and hydrogeological evidence for tsunamis in and around the island of Sicily, such an interpretation hints at the existence of some kind of collective cultural memory in the vicinity. On the other hand, Ammianus offers an arresting vignette of people recklessly collecting treasures and curiosities from the seafloor before being overcome by the returning waters, a decision that does not speak to any sense of familiarity, cultural or communal memory of any such an event. Perception of risk and actions in response to that risk seem here to be somewhat at odds with one another, perhaps reflecting the constructed nature of Ammianus' account. Jerome's text is both more diffuse and more tightly focused. Jerome himself seems to have hailed from somewhere in Dalmatia, though the precise whereabouts of his hometown of Stridon are unknown. Modern scholarship suggests that in the more recent past, the region has been characterised by comparatively frequent, if relatively low level tsunamis, perhaps occurring often enough for a collective awareness of such events to be preserved in cultural memory. Jerome provides a tantalising hint of such an awareness when he notes that the inhabitants of the region feared that what they saw had happened elsewhere might befall them and their town be utterly destroyed. Tempting to infer that he's here referring to an event preserved in his Chronicon for the year 346 and in the roughly contemporaneous Expositio Totius Mundi, when the Dalmatian city of Dyrrhachium was swallowed up by an earthquake and or maybe seismic sea wave, although the textual tradition for such a reading is rather tangled. Nonetheless, at this particular moment in time, in this particular place, the residents of this region appear familiar enough with the spectacle of roaring waves and heaving waters and the swirling billows mountain high dashing on the shore to be afraid and to adopt a specific strategy in response. According to Jerome, they made their way to the old man and as if preparing for a battle, placed him on the shore. Jerome's intent here is clearly to emphasise the holy man's control over the natural elements as his heroic account of the saint making the sign of the cross and holding his arms aloft to hold off the tsunami makes clear. But if there's any recoverable reality lurking behind the narrative he constructs, we may perhaps ponder the decision-making process and actions of the inhabitants of the region when faced with this wall of water. According to Jerome, they sought out an identifiable figure of power confident in the knowledge that he would deliver them from this hazard. Now, Hilarion himself was a stranger in this locale, having fled there from Sicily to avoid the fame that had grown around his holiness and miracle. But in this context, for the inhabitants of this region, he could be interpreted, glossed or approached as a recognisable figure imbued with power to intercede between human populations and the physical metaphysical world that surrounded them. We catch glimpses elsewhere in our late antique texts of figures of this sort in the guise of storm talkers and other experts in the interpretation and neutralisation of natural and supernatural hazards. In this particular region, therefore, the inhabitants were acclimated to the need for powerful figures of intercession vis-à-vis -vis the world around them. In identifying Hilarion as fulfilling that role, they were enlisting that perception as a tool for normalising and incorporating an unknown, potentially threatening figure into their risk scape. Such a strategy was itself inherently risky. Hilarion might refuse. He might fail. Either his success or his failure might destabilise existing social structures, lead to exploitation, abuse or conflict within the community. What emerges here then is a population that is not passively risk averse, but on the contrary, constantly engaged in the process of evaluating a multidimensional, ever shifting landscape of threat and opportunity and of acting in response to that evaluation. Their culture of risk 
their strategies for managing, mitigating, responding to or recovering from risk were not always successful. Communities were overcome by floods or earthquakes. They did experience famines and pestilence. Individuals did make poor economic choices or suffer the effects of an unexpected frost or an unusually dry summer. The threat of or reality of violence, exploitation and dominance were intrinsic and constant experiences for the vast majority of the denizens of the But their responses to this overwhelming concatenation of threats reveals agency, evaluation and variability at a micro-regional level. This diversity of localised experiences defies categorisation into the neat, seductive, but ultimately sterile and deterministic narratives of environmental disaster and societal devolution that have come to dominate accounts of this period. Thank you.